This Week in Agribusiness, serving America's most essential industry with agriculture broadcaster Orion Samuelson and yours truly, Max Armstrong, and featuring agriculture meteorologist Greg Solier. This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Firestone. You never farm alone. Harvest is underway, but some farmers still found time to get out to a farm show. Hello folks, welcome to This Week in Agribusiness. I'm Mike Pearson here in the studio this week. We'll be checking in with Max Armstrong throughout the show. As fall gets underway, one of the signs in the Eastern Corn Belt is the Ohio Farm Science Review. It went virtual in 2020, but it's back in 2021. And Ty Higgins from Ohio Farm Bureau has an update. Mike, a little bit of a soggy week here at Farm Science Review at the Molly Karen Ag Center in London, Ohio. But after last year's virtual show, rain wasn't going to keep farmers away from this year's show. Everybody's excited about being back here face to face. It's not just about tractors and, and planters. It's really about getting to be in front of uh, experts throughout the Ohio State University. A lot of questions out there as, as we get to harvest time and a chance to really see uh, those experts face to face and, and learn some great agronomic things here at Farm Science Review all week long. That's right, and there's a lot of opportunities for that. So the entire Farm Science Review is set up with different exhibit spaces and educational opportunities, as well as some of our exhibitors where you can See the equipment up front, you can ask the questions, get a little bit of information about the uh, innovation and technology, and any kind of question that you have, whether it's about traditional agriculture through innovation, and even we'll talk a little bit here about uh, immersive theater is something that you can see and do here. Yeah, always something new at Farm Science Review. So tell us what we have behind us. So behind us we have what we're calling the iFarm Theater. It's actually an immersive theater. So if you've ever been part of a um, virtual reality where you put the glasses and goggles on and you kind of got a feel for that simulation. It's that plus an IMAX theater experience. And so as you step into the theater, it sits about 20 individuals. We have around 18 different types of films that have been done that are about five to 10 minutes long, uh, all the way from being a beekeeper in real life and, uh, well, not real life, I guess, right, virtually. So you can uh, feel like you put the suit on and are engaging right in the beehive through having crop dusters and sitting in a cockpit or looking at how the spray comes out under the wing, all the way through uh, an actual county fair and seeing that from up above instead of from down below in the crowds where you're just trying to fight for space. What are some other highlights for this week? Other highlights, I always love to go to the Ask the Expert because they have the most interesting questions being asked. And, and not only do we have panelists like on um, topics related to like carbon and carbon markets, we have information on financial um, aspects of the farm and estate planning all the way through uh, soil conservation and, um, and just thinking about different ways to engage related to make your business and your operations more effective. You actually get to get on and ask the questions live, so it's always interesting to see who comes on and asks something and if we can stump our experts or not. You mentioned how successful 2020 was going virtual, but how much more important is it to actually be in front of these farmers and, and give them the information they need in person? It is, it's critical. I mean, you can just even see the energy. Everybody's so happy to be by one another. You get a chance to really have the hands-on engagement. Virtual um, programming is really important, but just being able to have that experience, engage with others, ask questions, and then see one another. It's just really uh, a great way to bring our agricultural community together and, uh, and share what we know and, uh, and keep our relationships going for those that we wish we would have seen two or last year um, that we're seeing this year. Mike, each year Farm Science Review welcomes over 100,000 farmers, exhibitors, and agriculture enthusiasts from all across the Midwest. For This Week in Agribusiness, I'm Ty Higgins reporting. Great to see farmers getting together in person there at the Ohio Farm Science Review. Max Armstrong has had a chance to check in with growers around the country to see how harvest is progressing in their neck of the woods. Well, Mike, some of those rains in Ohio would have been welcome a few days ago by producers. It could have made a difference in the bean crop, and that's the case also in Indiana, where Paul Hodgett, who farms west of Indianapolis at Rochdale, Indiana, shared with us this week what he had seen in his fields. We really think we've lost some top-end yield, especially in the soybeans, uh, just from it being so dry uh, in August. We really needed a, another, another rain to really push the beans over the edge. The corn, uh, what we have shelled so far, we're about 10% uh, into the corn and we're about 25% down with our beans. Uh, the corn is yielding still very well. Uh, the beans are, are just just average, nothing to write home about, but they're not a disappointment either. So 
we're expecting solid yields on on both both crops but the that dryness did hurt a little bit we're looking at a, a record pace here in harvest there's going to be a lot of operations finishing up beans within the next 10 days and this weather holds as what they're forecasting it's going to be a breakneck speed harvest here in in the western part of indiana we appreciated Paul's assessment of the crop. It is interesting to note, though, according to weekly crop bulletins earlier in the week, the highest rated soybeans in the country were in the state of Indiana. Where's the good corn this year? Well, Pennsylvania, Kentucky, Tennessee, North Carolina is another state. We were there this week with Alex Yost as we were talking with him on a farm near Ramsar, North Carolina. The last two years have been great. Um, I feel like three or four years ago, Every year, uh, I've never heard of a normal year. Every year is different. Um, we've had severe drought. We've had severe rain. The last two seasons, I think the growers in, in North Carolina have been able to really cash in and uh, make up for some lost opportunity in uh, the years prior to that. It's interesting when you look at weekly crop bulletins and you see some of the best crop in the country is in North Carolina. That's an eye opener. Absolutely. And we, we take pride in that. Um, we get a lot of slack for our soil types and how, how they differ across the state. And uh, I'm from Salisbury, and we have this good red dirt that we have here in Ramsour. And I want people to know that you can actually make a good crop on red, red clay. Well, the great industry analyst, market advisors, and others, Mike, will be watching closely for those reports coming right off the combine over the next few days as the pace of harvest will advance rapidly as we move on into the early days of October. Thank you, Max. And let's keep taking a look at those harvest updates. Our market analyst this week is Sam Hudson from Corn Belt Marketing in Brimfield, Illinois. Sam, how's the harvest shaping up in central Illinois? Uh, we're making quick work of it, uh, Mike. Thanks for having me. Uh, we, we've seen plenty of disease pressure around the area, and uh, harvest got going around here seven to ten days earlier than what a lot of people thought. I think it, most people were thinking at the beginning of September that it would be the week of the 20th. Uh, but with some of that premature death, we're seeing moisture levels come down. We've seen hot, warm, uh, windy weather for the most part. Uh, and, and so guys are able to make, uh, like I said, a quick work of it. And I think we're just going to get starting into the, into the soybeans as the, the weekend hits. Yeah, that is the time of year. Well, Sam, let's talk a little bit about this corn market. On the demand side, export sales this past week were on the low end of analyst expectations. What do you see going forward? Well, I, I think you hit the head, nail on the head there. I mean, it was kind of you know, as expected. Uh, we continue to see the goal for cover after Hurricane Ida down in, the, in Louisiana. But in the meantime, we've continued to see the processor and the feed guys step up and, and they're able to buy inventories here on those ends uh, for the cheapest values than they have been in several months. So even though prices are somewhat elevated, even though we haven't had an export market, I think that helps buffer the blow. Uh, locally here, we've seen our cash inversions taken out by the tune of about a buck over the last 10 days. So those early harvest premiums have, have more or less disappeared here. And with the lower yields and, you know, ultimately at the same time, the farmer gets more storage if he's got lower yields. Uh, I, I think as soon as they get away uh, from any over on bushels that they've got to take care of, which could be quicker this year than, than what we've seen in, in recent years, I think this crop gets buttoned up. That should provide a good harvest basis rally as we get into late October, early November. And when you look at the forecast, there's not much to, to slow this thing down. No, there, there really isn't. I've been hearing that from a lot of producers that they are hitting the ground running. You did mention that end users are getting needs, uh, needs secured going forward. We've had that December contract bouncing around 520 over this past week. Sam, how aggressive should those end users be in uh, securing those needs for the foreseeable future. Well, when you look at the dynamic we had going into this thing, you know, we've talked about our lower exports. That, that's their opportunity to really step up because in another week to 10 days, two weeks, they're really going to be fighting for it. Uh, the Gulf has done a great job, you know, getting things back online, but they're still working through a backlog. Uh, and the big challenge has been getting empty barges and vessels back up. Uh, to load because uh, harvest in the south was already going when Ida hit or, or you know was going to be happening right on the heels of that and now we've got a big rush to get up to the central corn belt to, to get these inventories moving uh, but again I, I think it's a great opportunity for them to get those inventories locked up and at least cover their needs for the next three or four months I think that them and the rest of the world need to do that ahead of South America's growing season because if they have another you know hiccup in terms of production uh, we're looking at significantly higher prices again next spring. Now, Sam, looking at the week ahead, of course, we do have the September quarterly stocks estimates coming out next Thursday. Do you anticipate that to be a market mover here in this uh, marketing season? You know, I, I would look for it to be a, about as expected, especially on the soybean side. You know, we're so tight there. Stocks usage was three and a half, four percent. We're still there. We could see yields a little bit higher. You know, early yield indications are, are pretty good, but we haven't had enough done there yet. 
Uh, and I just think this pipeline in general has been so, so tight and so thin. Commercials have been as empty as they've ever been here for the last 10 years. Uh, and it doesn't leave a lot of room for surprise there. So I'm not expecting a big move there. I think the bigger, uh, bigger moving factor is going to be the sentiment going into this October report. When you think about that, heck, that's you know a little over two weeks, three weeks out, and we're going to be probably well over 50% harvested in corn by then, and probably have a third of the bean crop under our belt if this forecast holds. That's a really good point. There will be a lot of things to take into consideration. We'll come back. There's a lot more going on in these markets to discuss, and when we return, Sam Hudson will help us break them down. This portion of This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by AgriGold, your seed ally in the field with unparalleled options that perform on your farm. Learn more at agrigold.com. And we're back talking markets with Sam Hudson of Corn Belt Marketing. And Sam, the bean market, specifically the bean oil market, got a little bit of a scare this week. Bring us up to speed. What happened? Well, yeah, you know, we've seen, you know, continued rhetoric out of Washington that continues to squash sentiment on biofuels in general. If you remember, we actually saw this happen about a month ago. Uh, I believe a Reuters headline came out and, and talked about lower mandates. And then after the close, talked about higher mandates. So we continue to see so much confusion and uncertainty there. And I think that poses the biggest problem is just the vacuum in general. What is the market going to assume when we don't have any facts? And then it, whether it's the Biden administration or anybody else in office, it just seems like that decision always gets you know kicked down the road. Uh, and now we continue to see you know the big oil lobby went out again you know on, on top, and and we see a lot more favoritism towards the, the move towards electric vehicles as opposed to the biofuels. So I still think at some point maybe we get uh, you know a nod there if the administration wants to stick to anything that they ran on. You would think that they would try to support that cause, but in the meantime, once again we've got that uncertainty, that vacuum. Uh, and in that vacuum, you know, the market's going to fill the void. But in the background, you know, the next five to 10 years, you know, there's still all this talk about biodiesel and, and you know, the demand for that uh, and the fact that, you know, some of those numbers that are being thrown around, we don't even know if we've got the acres to suffice on that. So uh, definitely a lot to develop here over the next two to three, five years. That is true. And even with the uncertain demand ahead as you're looking at renewable diesel, we are continuing to see very strong demand of soybean exports, China and others back in the markets for about a million metric tons worth of sales this past week of the new crop. Sam, looking out longer term, do you expect to see these export sales continue? You know, I think we will. You know, keep in mind, we don't, we aren't, China's not going to have the export program or we're not going to have the export program to China with the breadth and depth of what we saw last year. But that just gives us a little bit more time, and a little more flexibility. And we've needed that, obviously, on the front end here with this hurricane, uh, you know, delaying a lot of these shipments. So as we get into the winter months, I would expect them to continue to gobble up uh, you know, those inventories until they have a better indication that South America is going to look good. Uh, you know, another theme going into next year, too, is, is uh, acreage. You know, what's going to happen with acreage? Uh, because you have fertilizer prices that are just soaring, and this is true in the U.S., Canada, South America. Uh, it could be something that could detract from corn acres as we move into 2022. You know, Sam, you mentioned the, the South America soybean planting. How are they, uh, at least in getting started down there in Brazil and Argentina this year on their soybean crop? Yeah, you know, great question. It's it, they're very early in their campaign, and obviously it's a very big region. So, uh, but planting is is going to be starting now in some of those areas, and it's very dry on the front end in some of those places. But that only encourages more seeding. Uh, and keep in mind, it's still very early. As long as they get timely rains, and we see some sort of pattern, you know, you know, sort of move towards normalcy. I think the market will pay attention to that. But until that happens. Uh, you know, the market's going to be on pins and needles because we still have, you know, relatively tight, tight stocks to usage. And I think after February 1st, we really start to figure that out one way or the other. Sam, before we let you go, let's chat a little bit about the wheat market. What are you seeing as you look here in the near term in, uh, in the classes of wheat? Well, you know, we saw a pretty solid break in, in, in the wheat complexes across the board. And when that happened, um, you know, we attracted some demand. When you look at the world carryouts and world stocks to usage, we're not running out of wheat. Uh, but when you look at just on the domestic side, we were about a 40% stock to usage this time last year. Now we're about 30%. So we've got plenty left around, but we've shaved that off 10%. Once again, I think this goes back to you know the talk for acres in the next year when all these small grains, these production problems in the Canadian prairies and the Northwest Corn Belt, it's going to be probably a little bit easier for wheat to stay in the mix here. Uh, compared to corn, and, and I think that just fuels that acreage battle into next year in general. Lots to keep an eye on as we look out to the future. Thank you to Sam Hudson from Corn Belt Marketing. Chad Colby's look at agriculture technology comes your way next, brought to you by the IBM Watson Decision Platform. Combining AI with Internet of Things data to help agribusiness increase yields, improve quality, and drive sustainability. 
Chad Colby joins us next with a look at agriculture technology. One of the things we've seen is that technology and agronomy often go hand in hand when farmers are looking at their operation and planning for their future. How hard do you push your operation? Hi everyone, I'm Chad Colby and on this week's tech segment, I caught up with our friends from the Wade Farms, Jacob Wade. And one of the things I've always found interesting with them is they've always pushed those limits. And I mean the limits of equipment, nutrition, hybrid selection, you name it. And all those studies and trials they've done the last several years have led them to the decision in 2022, they're gonna be all 15 inch corn. And I was curious how Jacob came to that decision. My decision to go to 15 inch corn was influenced by I feel like we're maxing out my population in 30 inch rows and the roots just are running out of space. So one way to optimize the root zone is to spread out the plants and narrow rows will be the ability for me to do that. Once Jacob started to realize that this was a path he wanted to go down and he saw some positive results, he had to tackle the equipment side of things. And in some of that, as many of you know, you gotta walk a little slow before you run. They bought this planter here, used this past year up in North Dakota and loved how well it made them a lot more efficient. Over the last several years, they were using a 20 foot corn head. And let me tell you, that can be a challenge when you got a lot of acres to cover. Last year, we were a 20 foot, 15 inch gearing off corn head. This year, we're a 30 foot, 24 row and it just gives me the ability to do a larger scale work with 15 inch corn and we're going to be switching for next year to all 15 inch corn so i really needed to see how it was going to work full scale on my operation and this 30 foot corn head is the only dual gathering chain 15 inch corn head on the market so that technology is pretty cool and allows us to do lots of things that we couldn't in the past one thing i appreciate so much about jacob and his father brad is they're very forthcoming about anything they learned on their farm and they're open to share it. For This Week in Agribusiness, I'm Chad Colby. Thank you, Chad. Technology is always changing. And one of the places it's changing constantly is in plant health. Later in the program, we'll have another update from our BASF Plant Smart Grow Smart series. Thanks for joining us on This Week in Agribusiness. As folks are gearing up for harvest, it's a great time to take a pause and look at how your operation is structured. Is it safe? Will it be safe for everybody throughout the season? To help get us some answers for that, we're going to chat with Jason Berkland. He is the Vice President of Risk Management at Nationwide Insurance. Jason, let's talk a little bit about ways to keep things safe on the farm. I know one of the big ways to do that is to make sure you're in control of your surroundings on the farm. Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, we're coming upon harvest time and we're going to be in the heat of the battle. Uh, things are going to come at us pretty quickly. So what we're asking is, hey, be aware of your surroundings, be aware of, you know, PTO shafts, belt conveyors, anything with moving pieces and parts, um, flowing grain in your operation. Where are your hazard hazardous areas? Where are your critical control points that we need to be looking out for? And this time of year, of course, Jason, we've got a lot of farmers climbing in and out of grain bins, getting that grain into position for winter. You guys at Nationwide have done a lot of work with grain bin safety. Can you give us any tips or updates? Yeah, our grain bin safety campaign, uh, you know, kind of wound down here for 2021, but uh, happy to report we had over 50 additional rescue tubes that were donated through our generous sponsors. Um, the training and rescue tubes are being delivered here throughout the remainder of 2021 and into 2022. Um, 50 additional ones, and, and now we're up over 200 for the total of the, for the life of the campaign that started in 2014. Um, it's spread across 30 states. Uh, focusing on fire departments that may be involved or called to a grain entrapment. So anywhere rural fire departments um, could be volunteers, but that, that tube and training is vital equipment if an entrapment does occur. It is getting it out there, getting more safety equipment into the countryside close to the folks who are going to need it. Jason, looking at this harvest in particular, it's always a struggle to find help on the farm, but this year might be worse than usual and it might be tempting to look to using uh, our families as harvest help. What are some things growers should have in mind before they put Junior in the cab of that tractor or a combine? 
Yeah, it sure is. Um, labor shortage all over there, all over the country. Uh, so it, it it's going to look like, hey, I just need somebody to watch that leg. I just need somebody to watch that auger. I'll have my son or daughter come out and 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 kind of watch that. Things happen on the farm very quickly, and it could be you know an auger. It could be riding in a in a tractor, riding in a combine. But things happen very quickly and. Age appropriateness is one thing we want every to, everybody to be aware of. Think about what does that child know about the operation or safe operation of that piece of equipment? Do they know how to shut it off? Do they know where they should stand? Do they know where, where to and where not to put their extremities so um, they don't get caught or don't get uh, entangled in any piece of equipment? So really, we want our farmers to think about should kids be with us in the combine? Should kids be, you know, watching augers? What does that mean on your farm? Because each one's different. Each operation has their own uh, processes or procedures. That's true. Every farm is different. But Jason, when we think about safety, one of the things that's that was always tough for me to do on the farm, but it makes so much sense, is just removing the keys when you're done using it, prohibiting that unauthorized uh, access to the equipment. Yeah, it's similar to uh, you know lockout tagout. You're going to remove the keys, of, or you're going to remove the keys of a piece of equipment, just like you're going to de-energize and lock out an auger, you know, so that nobody can turn it on while you're fixing it or unclogging it or working on it. That's what we want to we want you to think about because yeah, it may be hey, I I've always let my kid ride that ATV. Well, now we got a lot more equipment around. We have a lot more um, potentials for things to occur and. It, it's just um, a, a hazard that we see and want everybody to be aware of. Take those keys out, uh, make sure you know where, where the kids are at and that we're all being safe. Be alert sums up so much when it comes to safety requirements on the farm. But one of the things we see each year at harvest time on social media, of course, are pictures of families out there riding the combine together, you know, children, grandchildren doing ride alongs. It's perceived as being very safe. But Jason, there are always some things to weigh with uh, with bringing youth onto a farm, aren't there? Yeah, there is. Do, do they know how the equipment operates? Is it safe to have them in? It, it may be. You have to look at your operation, your piece of equipment that you may be uh, letting them ride along with. Um, as I think about it, we just want to, we want you to think about it ahead of time before just allowing somebody to ride in the tractor, ride in the combine. Some are built for it, some aren't. I, you know, unfortunately remember when I was little and, and riding on the back of a tractor, a cabless tractor, you just stood on the hitch and, and you rode along. Those, those days are in our past and we really want everybody to be careful and safe as they go through this harvest. 60% of the children injured in agricultural accidents are riding along on a piece of equipment. So that, it's a substantial amount. It certainly is. And of course, when you've got mom and dad or entire families engaged in field work at harvest time, sometimes uh, kids are, are left at home kind of fending for themselves. Jason, that's always something to consider as well at harvest season. That is uh, really something we want to consider this, you know, this year, but years past and years going forward. How do we uh, make sure that the kids aren't following mom or dad out to, while they're watching the, you know, grain legs or watching the augers, watching the grain flow? How do we make sure the kids aren't following us out? And if they are, how do you put up a barricade or a safety stop? Just be thinking about areas, PTO shafts that are running. Um, are they guarded? Even a loose piece of piece of clothing can get entangled and pull an individual in. So how are we putting up safety stops, putting up uh, barricades around those areas so that um, children, unfortunately, if they do come out to find mom or dad, they're not going in those dangerous areas where they might get entangled in a piece of equipment. Absolutely. All things to think about this harvest season. This week at Agribusiness, serving America's most essential industry, is brought to you by Firestone. You never farm alone. Welcome back to This Week in Agribusiness. As harvest gets underway across the Corn Belt, it's a great time for farmers to evaluate how the practices they changed on their operation impacted their yield. Max had a chance to visit with Andy Cap of Clarksville, Missouri in our latest Plant Smart, Grow Smart installment and see just how his plant health program changed his yield. How much acreage do you farm all together? We planted a little over 3,000 acres. All corn and beans? Corn and soybeans. That keeps you busy, doesn't that it? That keeps me busy. <laughs> 
How would you characterize your uh, disease pressure here? As you've perceived it over the years, has it been noticeable to you? Our disease pressure is noticeable, but it's not immense. Um, frog eye leaf spot is probably our main culprit in soybeans. Several things we'll pick on and work on our corn yield, but it's really, it's not predictable and it's not significant, but we're, with these products, we're still able to increase our total farm average, increase the yield averages on the fields that we're using. And then we'll hit one year out of four where it's extremely beneficial. What fungicides have you used, Andy? And, and share with us uh, the results that you've seen then. So Veltima and Revitec are the, the, the two that we're mainly focused on this year. And probably three years of history with them, just to see if they were replacing what we were using in the past. You were easing into it a little Correct. bit. Correct. And that, that's probably my tendency to, to just come in and, and make something prove or earn its way onto the farm. Do you try to stay flexible a little bit, never knowing what a growing season is going to present to you? You never know what you're going to run into at planting, for example? No doubt that farming is flexible. I have a good plan when we start and, and build that during the winter, but you need to flex and move and be adaptable and ready to, ready to make changes and, and then figure out which changes are going to work the best. Was there a, an aha moment, as they would put it, uh, when, when that light bulb went on, you said, oh, wait a minute here. So 2014 comes to mind. Um, we had late season, uh, northern corn leaf blight came into fields that where application didn't get into the corners and just where you had a strip or a light place where application didn't hit it, corn yield was affected significantly. Looking at the crops at, at this stage, prior to this, this harvest of 2021, can you see visibly see in your mind that, that there's that, that plant health that you want to achieve. Can you, can you tell a difference? When you get in and look at the leaf health, get in and, and just really look at the plant health, it looks good. Um, soybeans, the color and the vigor in them looks excellent and we're very pleased. We'll, we'll hope we can gather another rain or two before they're done filling, but it looks like a very good crop. Thank you, Max, for that update. And if any of you want to learn more or see the rest of the PlanSmart GrowSmart series from BASF, visit PlanSmartGrowSmart.com. Greg Solier now brings us his farm weather forecast for the week ahead, presented by Pivot Bio Proven 40. Predictable, productive, weatherproof. Turn to a better nitrogen. Turn to Pivot Bio Proven 40. Learn more at PivotBio.com. Well, it's time to check in on weather. Greg Solier is here, and Greg, across the Pacific Northwest, they caught a little rain this past week. Yeah, nice to have the first fall weather system on the books, and another one, perhaps even two more on uh, the heels of that one. It is the time of the year to start the recharge uh, process, and boy, we need it big time. It has come with a problem, though, the southern extent of these troughs into the Great Basin and parts of Northern California fanning the fire situation. But with time, we'll be able to make up these uh, moisture deficits. It's the problem is some of these weather systems may bring the moisture down all at once. And so once again, you have these debris flows to get going. But in any event, and that's in higher elevations, a cooler trough and significant moisture, including some showers and thunderstorms, highest peaks of the Cascades and Northern Rockies may get some moisture. The warmth is still summertime style, maybe pushing the 90 degree mark in some areas from the Black Hills on southward. So here's that uh, classic range of temperatures and weather for the fall season to the Pacific Northwest. That weather system dashes quickly and weekends. Another one on its heels, another buckle across the east. Eastern Pacific that with time will move inland uh, cooler to colder across the northern Rockies. Nothing unusual back into slightly cooler air and maybe a little more moisture in the offing. But at best, it's scant across the worst drought areas of the Dakotas and southern Canadian prairie. But again, it, this too shall pass. Moisture is a coming, but it's still perhaps uh, weeks away. Cooler weather into the valleys of California. Maybe a stray shower as well from Napa northward. Uh, seasonal weather across the southwestern states. The warmth continues out of the southern plains and a couple of showers and thunderstorms. Yeah, they've been dusting. 
that winter wheat crop in. It's too dry, really anything else to just get it in the ground. We need moisture in those drought areas of the plains. Not much in the offing other than a stray shower thunderstorm. The late portions of the week here. Cooler air into the uh, southwestern states and a trough and a cool front. The first one of the season expected there, Mike, in that part of the country. Well, Greg, across the Corn Belt, there was a little bit of a cool down this past week. Do yeah. those fall temps continue? Uh, no. Matter of fact, we go back in the other direction around here. Remember, we have talked about this on the longer range uh, stuff around here that we're not done with summertime. We're not done with warmth. More importantly, moisture reduction, dry down values coming off the significant rains that played out across a good part of the Corn Belt, up to five inches in some of the lower Great Lakes region. But here's the next weather system. Ridge of high pressure, wind and warmth across the Great Plains. Seasonal conditions up towards the suit. A couple of spotty to scattered showers across the Dakotas and southern Canadian Prairie. This boundary will slow on up. Jet stream winds come in from the southwest and more warmth. 85 to 90 degree air across parts of the plains, 80 up to maybe about the I-80 corridor. High pressure otherwise across the Corn Belt opportunities to get back out there with time with early harvest operations with dry down and drying of soils as well. Some humidity, some late season heat, couple of scattered showers and thunderstorms continue on in areas of the southern plain states areas and uh, the Gulf Coast area. We'll keep an eye on a tropical system, the western Gulf. This boundary stalls on out. Maybe some rain prospects from the Ozarks on southward into Texas for those winter wheat fields later in the week. Eastern Corn Belt growers saw harvest slow down last week with some rain. Greg, what's this next week look like? Uh, the rain is out, but the rain was of great benefit to areas of the northeast of New England with still some windy conditions here. Cool, high pressure and control and mild and dry across much of the eastern Corn Belt. A couple of scattered showers and thunderstorms upstream to the northwest and here back into the western uh, complex, maybe a thunderstorm, but summer warmth across the Midwest into parts of the uh, northeast of New England with time opportunities for field work galore as the week wears on. Quite over the southeastern part of the country with seasonal uh, conditions, humidity and warmth build on in and a tropical system with scattered showers and thunderstorms across the Gulf Coast. High pressure and control otherwise across much of the mid-Atlantic region. Greg Sodier is back with his extended farm weather forecast for the country presented by Pivot Bio Proven 40. Predictable, productive, weatherproof. Turn to a better nitrogen. Turn to Pivot Bio Proven 40. Learn more at pivotbio.com. Well, Greg, more and more farmers are itching to get into the field. What does the precipitation forecast look like next week? I think uh, an absence of anything really widespread or organized, so that's relatively good news as it applies to the central and eastern Corn Belt locales. That wind-driven autumn storm arrived just on time for the first day of autumn across uh, this part of the country. In the meantime, just scattered, maybe fair coverage, quarter inch late in the week, maybe, perhaps, but otherwise we will get into warmer, drier here late in the week and towards the following week. Again, Gulf moisture returns in. Systems begin to come out of the southwest, and we pick up moisture here across the Gulf Coast and southeastern states. Tropics getting a little busy here, maybe down across south Texas with time. Fair coverage, quarter to half inch across the Pacific Northwest, roughly from the Missouri on westward. Mike, signs of a pattern shift in the weeks to come here of more moisture. Well, that first full week in October, Greg, what do you see for a temperature forecast? N nothing to fall like whatsoever. This is more or less the feel of August uh, over parts of the heartland. I think still some record setting near 90 degree heat anticipated, maybe 80 into the Corn Belt. Cooler conditions with cloud cover over the southeast, southwestern uh, part of the country, a little above average. And the moisture is coming back into play. Note the southwest to northeast jet stream pattern. This is not the way it'll play out the wintertime season. We can take every moisture source we can get with rain, perhaps some mountain snow out here. Higher peaks above average across the deep south and southeast part of the country for maybe cotton harvest. Perhaps that'll get delayed drying out across the heartland, including much of the Corn Belt. The week of October 11th, Greg, do those temperatures start to moderate? Not really. We continue on a fairly warm note. We do get an upper air trough, a pretty snappy weather system. It's going to be really these all or nothing wide ranging weather systems that come on through regarding temperature and moisture. So we do get a drop into the northern plains, Pacific Northwest, Northern California. No cold air in sight per se. And the warmth continues on from the southern plains into the eastern Corn Belt, the northeast of New England. Temps about normal the southeastern part of the country and a pretty good swath of moisture into the northwest. Parts of the Dakotas, we need it here. 
clear northwest as well. Canadian Prairie and there'll be some harvest delays across the heart of the Corn Belt and an eye here for the tropics that may get busy over the southeastern part of the country back to dry time Texas, the southwest and into the valleys of California. Now as October comes to a close, Greg, is that pattern shift in effect? Absolutely, positively not. <laughs> not quite. We're getting there. We're getting there as we get into November. Yes, but in the meantime, note how the jet stream arcs to the north, builds to the south and southeast. We think ultimately this ridge collapses, moves back to the southwestern part of the country, and then the cold air at the beginning part of November settles on in. Temps otherwise below average here, normal of the southwestern part of the country and above into the Pacific Northwest. But this will be delight uh, with uh, outdoor work and livestock operations, heating bills and all that into the northern Plain States areas where we get a window of opportunity again. Again, this will not be a delayed harvest season whatsoever. Uh, southern Plains across the heart of the Corn Belt drying out nicely. Tropics are busy here north and west of the storm track from the tropics. Again, you get sinking air and dry time. That's beneficial for the heartland, the Midwest, the Corn Belt and the moisture machine is back into play across much of California, the Pacific Northwest and Northern Rockies. So we do see a shift as we get into the first week to 10 days of November. Good part of October, though, warmer and drier as it applies to much of the Plains and Corn Belt. Next on This Week in Agribusiness, it's Max's Tractor Shed, spotlighting another great American tractor. In the past, we've shared with you stories of people who love their old tractors enough they give them a name, or maybe they give them a name because they don't love them. We'll tell you the story about Babe the Blue Ox this weekend at Max's Tractor Shed, brought to you by Store Lock Tool Cabinets. You've heard me talk about the utility of these cabinets in farm shops. They have a wide range of cabinets, not just tool cabinets. You owe it to yourself to check out what they have at storelog.com. Made in America quality, S-T-O-R-L-O-C.com. Well, Zach Smith does love his old Ford tractor. In fact, he did give it a name. He calls it Babe the Blue Ox, which makes sense when you see that blue Ford 7710 made almost 40 years ago. He gave it a facelift the other day. He posted pictures on Facebook and thanked his wife, Diane, because she allowed him to bring the hood into the house to complete that work. I think it was decal work at that point, so it wasn't any spray paint, we hope, in the living room. Zach Smith 7710 Made in 1983, we trust that came out of the plant at Romeo, Michigan, that Ford 7710. Mark Stock would tell you to fix it up all right, make it look good, get it ready for the auction. Let's find out what's in the report this weekend from Big Iron. Well, folks, our September 29th auction is a big one this year. We've got just under 3,000 items selling on BigIron.com. Leo Raves Farm Retirement Sale in Coleman, South Dakota, features some really nice equipment, folks. They got 199 items, a 2010 Case IH 9120 Rear Wheel Assist Combine. There's a Case IH Magnum 305 tractor, a Kinsey 3600 Series 16 31 row planter. They've also got a Case W14B wheel loader with a 188 inch bucket. Lyle Hogger is retiring from Irene. South Dakota. They have 57 items, including a 2011 Versatile 400 four-wheel drive tractor. There's a Case IH 7220 mechanical front tractor and a John Deere 9450 combine. They've also got a John Deere 9410 maximizer combine. Check out their International 706 tractor with a loader. Silver Spur Farm Operating Company LLC with various locations in Nebraska. They've got 141 items for sale. Check out their two John Deere 544K high lift wheel loaders. One's a 2000 2015 model, the other 2010. They've also got a 2012 Landall 7550 vertical tillage plus 44 foot vertical till machine. They have a really nice triaxle live bottom belt trailer. Plus they have a JBS VM 3048 triaxle manure spreader. Max, all this equipment sells on September the 29th, no reserve on BigIron.com. FFA Chapter Tribute is sponsored by Nationwide, the number one farm insurer in the country. To register your FFA Chapter, go to NationwideSupportsFFA.com. That's NationwideSupportsFFA.com. Nationwide, we stand for you. This Week in Agribusiness is always proud to salute the men and women of the FFA. And this week, we're getting to know Nicholas Newman. He is serving this year as the Indiana FFA State Secretary. Nicholas, thank you for taking the time to talk to us. 
Thank you so much for having me on today. Tell me a little bit about what this year looks like as the FFA State Secretary for Indiana. Definitely. So this year, unlike a lot of states, Indiana, we take a gap year. So I just graduated high school and I will be going into college next year. But throughout this entire year, I will be serving Indiana FFA for 365 days. Um, some of that includes running conferences, doing chapter visits, a lot of banquets, speeches, um, visiting our businesses, businesses and industries, and just really getting to know the 11,544 FFA members across Indiana. Nicholas, what was it that got you involved in FFA in the first place? Definitely. So I come from Rush County, which is a very rural county. So within my high school, FFA is actually the largest organization. It's larger than our student council. So our chapter is about 125 members, which is quite large for Indiana. And my involvement really came from my siblings and my predecessors who have been within the Rushville FFA. So both my sister, my dad, they all went through our chapter and it really just encouraged me to start that life and to live that life of servant leadership. And this year you'll get a chance to live that life. What are you looking forward to the most in the year ahead? Definitely. So there's a lot of things to look forward to as a state officer, but the one thing I'm getting, I'm looking forward to the most is really our conferences. Um, we host eight conferences at the Leadership Center with the state officers writing the curriculum for every single one of them. And of those conferences, we get to meet about a thousand of our FFA members going through the Leadership Center, going through our curriculum and really getting to know them. So it's just an amazing opportunity, an amazing experience I'm looking forward to immensely. Well, we wish you the best of luck this week at Agribusiness. Proud to salute the FFA. As harvest gears up, there will be a lot more traffic on the road, and some of that traffic may be running significantly slower than cars who are used to traveling those highways. Max had a chance to talk with Illinois State Police about best practices during harvest season. Well, Mike, indeed, so many people are thinking right now about a number of things on their farm, how to market successfully, what the inputs are going to cost. They're also concerned about taxing matters, and many are just worried over the next few days about getting to the field safely and getting back home safely. These challenges along the roads have become a big problem. Visiting with us is Sergeant Tracy Lillard, Trooper Tracy of the Illinois State Police. You surely see this in such a major agriculture area that you serve. Yes, absolutely. So we work in a you know, an agriculture state, and we see it out there on the road all the time. We see farm implements out there. We see farmers, you know, they're excited, they're ready for harvest, and they're on their way. But we also see a lot of crashes that are related to people being impatient that are sharing the road with those farmers. I did a little Twitter survey the other day about this, and there were only 16% of the farmers who said they'd never had a problem with another motorist, a near collision of some sort. That was out of some 750 farmers who responded. And I guess that didn't surprise me, knowing what's going on here. Much of this is speed of the other motorist, right? Yes, absolutely. It's not only the speed, but it's um, a lot of tailgating. We have a lot of people that are following too closely to those farm implements. They're also passing when it's unsafe. And so when they're passing these farm implements, either at an intersection or in a no passing zone or where it's unsafe, that's where we have a lot of our problems. And that is something that's completely preventable. Um, and so a lot of it is just dealing with educating the motorists. But we wanna encourage farmers to be safe as well. And so one of the biggest things that I see is the slow moving vehicle emblem, uh, or I'm sorry, slow moving vehicle emblem. And when you have that on that is completely visible and your lights are visible and everything is working correctly, that is gonna help protect you as the farmer uh, be safe out there on the roads. One thing we've seen many times through the years, Tracy, is that left turn that the producer is making gets them in trouble. It's, it's often a real problem spot for the grower. Yes, so a lot of the field entrances when the farmer, you know, moves to the left or co goes out wide to make that wide turn, uh, people get impatient and then they begin to pass. For the motorists out there just to stay back, give them room and understand that they're going to take those turns, uh, those wide turns and, and that it's difficult to pull into those field entrances or even at an intersection. I know it's easier said than done, but is there a strategy that the grower can use? Can they can they hog the road a little bit more as they're coming up to that turn? Um, I just think that being patient as the farmer, you know, giving enough uh, notice, 
hogging the road is kind of tricky because especially if it's a two lane road, uh, I don't want to tell somebody something to pull out into the other lane of traffic and then risk being the cause of a crash. So just be patient, wait till there's ample time to turn. And even if that means holding up traffic behind you for just a second longer before you make that turn, uh, that might be necessary. I suppose a lot of growers would say speed enforcement would help, but that's easier said than done. In so many places where you patrol, uh, you're spread thin out there, you and the, the sheriff's deputies. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, we try our best to try to um, slow people down, but, you know, regardless if the speed limit signs are posted or not, people are going to continue to to speed and to pass improperly. And so, um you know, we'll do the best we can out there. And a lot of it is just uh, being visible, but also to educate the public to make sure that they're sharing the road safely and make sure that they understand what that slow moving vehicle emblem means. Trooper Tracy, we'll try to keep our farmers safe and other motorists safe and you folks uh, who enforce the law as well out there. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Trooper Tracy, Sergeant Tracy Lillard, Mike with the Illinois State Police. Thanks, Max. A good reminder for everybody out driving for the next six to eight weeks. There will be some big, slow moving equipment, and it's important that we all share the road. Folks, thanks so much for tuning in. We always look forward to seeing you here on This Week in Agribusiness, and we wish you the very best as harvest gets underway. Stay safe, and we'll see you next time. Closed captioning for This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Kubota. Shape your world. This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Firestone. You never farm alone. This Week in Agribusiness is produced by Omax Communication in association with 22 Creative Group. We invite you to visit us online at agbizweek.com.